This is Luke Kinetic, and you're in the arena with leaders and citizens who take character-based action. In the Arena is a proud member of the Democracy Group Podcast Network. For more information, visit democracygroup.org. Thank you today for joining us for the McCain Institute In the Arena podcast. I'm Rick Davis, chairman of the McCain Institute Foundation and a board member of the Institute. But for today, I'm the former campaign manager of two of John McCain's presidential campaigns and three of his Senate reelections. We're here today to talk to former speaker Paul Ryan about campaign war stories. So welcome to the In the Arena podcast. The first thing I'd like to do is maybe get started, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, with uh, a little bit of your um, uh, background. I mean, you know, uh, 54th Speaker of the House of Representatives, vice presidential nominee, uh, elected to Congress, what, eight, 10 times? Um, Yeah, 10 times. 10 times, (laughs) yep. Um, Probably... I would argue one of the most productive and efficient legislators in modern congressional history. You sponsored a lot of legislation and a lot of it got passed and signed into law. So uh, you were you were not uh, uh, lackadaisical in your approach to the day job and uh, and now a businessman. But probably first and foremost, uh, you you maintained a balance in your family life where you would go back to Janesville every weekend. You didn't create a. Uh, a space in Washington to uh, draw your attention away from your your family, and uh, and I think uh, a lot of people don't realize how difficult a situation it is to go back and forth, especially as far as somewhere like Janesville, Wisconsin. So kudos to you for for keeping that up. I would add just one ideological perspective, which I find almost uh, 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 missing in today's uh, legislative world, is you were a deficit hawk. <laughs> And we won't get yeah, into deficit right. discussions, yeah, no, today, that's fine. but but today you would be considered an endangered species, I believe, mm. <laughs> in that regard. But we're here to talk about politics and some of the war stories that uh, that we've encountered along the way. And uh, and I'd like to start at the beginning. Um, I, I I read up a little bit about your your early days uh, getting influenced by politics, uh, much like my own. I I went to school and had a perspective on being a Republican, but probably didn't really know what it was all about. Joined college Republicans, became an organizer in Alabama, uh, and uh, and started getting uh, well read on the topic of political ideology, and found common cause with a, a writer, Ann Rand, who I know you've spent uh, some time uh, around too. So, uh, give me a little sense as to what was the beginning trajectory of of Paul Ryan, future uh, vice presidential nominee. Yeah, well, that's. I mean, I can, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version, Rick. Uh, so, by the way, nice to be with you. Uh, so. My dad was a big fan of Reagan. Um, I'm from Janesville, Wisconsin, from a huge Irish Catholic family, which traditionally was sort of Kennedy Democrats. And uh, Ronald Reagan, who grew up in Dixon, Illinois, down the river from where we lived, Janesville was on the Rock River, so was Dixon. And my dad was just amazed that this guy from Dixon, Illinois, down the river c- became president of the United States. So I was pretty young that I was, you know, I was born in 1970, so I was 10 years old during that campaign. But I was fixated on it because my dad was fixated on it. So uh, Ronald Reagan was sort of my first um, um, entry into politics and just, you know, watching it and, and really, you know, being a huge Reagan fan. I'm on the Reagan uh, library board now as a result of that, you know, just my, my affinity for Reagan. Yep. Uh, and then when I was in high school, I read these novels. Uh, I read Ayn Rand novels, uh, which just about every, you know, a lot of high school kids do. And what that did was it triggered my interest in economics. Um, by no means do I subscribe to objectivism, and all those urban legends out there kind of accuse me of this. But you, know, you get those in politics, <laughs> right? The minute uh, you say anything Catholic. about it, you're immediately yeah, yeah, yeah. buttoned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Went to Catholic school, and you know, I'm, I'm a devout Catholic. But but Rand, in, in tr- those novels interested me in the study of economics, and right. I went to college and studied economics and political science and political philosophy. And uh, I really got into studying the the, the Austrians, uh, Mises, Hayek, you know, the Chicago school guys, you know, like Stiegler and Friedman and yep. all the rest. And so I really came focused on economics and, and Rand got me interested in economics. And uh, and so that's where I sort of cut my teeth. And like you, I didn't know that there were different kinds of Republicans. There are different kinds of conservatism. So in my college years, I really focused, uh, you know, Edmund Burke and everything. I read all the Renaissance writers, Voltaire and all of that. So I got really into that stuff in college. And I had an economics professor 
that introduced me, he sort of knew through my questions, you know, my macroeconomics guy, that I was conservative. Uh, so he introduced me to the National Review at the time. He said, you need to read this magazine. I'll just, I'll read mine and I'll give it to you every Thursday in class when I'm done with it. Uh, and so I got into the National Review and, and that's where I kind of learned about all the differences. And I became um, a big fan of Jack Kemp, frankly. Uh, I sort of subscribe myself to the supply side growth wing of the party. And back in the yeah. 80s, the supply side is really ascendance. You know, it's Jude Winiski and George Gilder and all those types of people. And I uh, interned- Well, they were, the, they were the influences in the Reagan administration, were. 1980, 1982 tax cuts and- Yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. Right. So I sort of read all of that stuff. Uh, the Laffler Curve. Right. Yeah, Laffler, Art's a great friend of mine. Uh, so I got really into that as a young guy. Uh, and then I went and interned for my home state senator, a guy named Bob Caston. You probably remember Bob Caston. Oh, yeah, he, I know Bob. He served during, the, during the, the, the McCain days. And that translated into a, a, a job, a full-time job, after graduating from college, uh, working on his economics policy staff. It's like I was just a grunt, a researcher. Uh, Bob lost his next election to a guy from down the street named Russ Feingold. Russ yeah. is from Janesville as well. Our parents were close friends and, you know, that's a whole other story. Well, I, I know Russ very well Russ from the campaign have a, yeah, finance exactly. uh, war. Precisely. So. so, yeah, I, I never agreed with that stuff. But, you know, Russ and I are friends to this day. You know, we pretty much disagreed on everything. We did a few bills together in the House and yeah. when he was in the Senate. So, um, so Russ, this guy I've known since I was a kid, uh, beats my boss, Bob Caston. I was like 22 years old then. Uh, and Jack Kemp asked Bob Caston, I'm forming this new think tank called Empower America. I'm looking for a young supply sider to do all my economics work. You got anybody in mind? Bob plucked me, you know, pumped me into that organization. I worked for Jack. Jack really became a mentor of mine. I lost my dad when I was a kid. Yep. So I always had mentors and I always yeah. sort of gravitated toward mentors. And Jack really became my mentor. Uh, then um, through Jack, I got deeply involved in in the, the movement conservatism in what I would call the growth wing of the party, the, the supply side wing of the party at the time, and really cut my teeth with him uh, and then worked back on the Hill as well. And then I ended up running for Congress. I went home when I was 27 years old, went to a family earth moving business where all my cousins worked, um, scoped it out. And, um, you know, my, my race, my first race in 98, uh, I replaced a guy who won by, I think, three tenths of a point in his first election the 94 sweep, which was a really good election right, year, right. replacing Les Aspen, you know, right. who had been a big there right. forever as a Democrat. It was a D3 district. Uh, and then he won by like six tenths of a point, his second reelect. And he uh, just thought it was too tough of a district. And he decided to take on Russ Feingold and run for the Senate. Now, <laughs> Mark Newman, I don't know if you remember that race or not. I do remember that race. But he vacated the seat and yeah. he tried to get me to run his campaign. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not. I'm a policy guy. I'm not a campaign guy. I don't want to do that. He said, well, then you should run for my seat. You know, you do that. And I'm like, I'm 27 years old. What? That's crazy. Yeah. And I ended up just talking to a lot of people. And Jack Kemp and Bill Bennett and other friends said, go for it. Just do it. What do you have to lose? And basically, I had nothing to lose. I was a single guy. And I, I assume I Ben Weber was uh, part of that troika yeah, that was, uh, yeah, probably ben encouraged you, too. He was a good great friend, friend of mine. And stalwart yeah. in the Empower America movement, too. Right. So, so that's Vin, what got Vin, you into that district. Yeah, Vin really helped me a lot, too. So Vin, Bob Cast, and Jack Kemp, those guys just gave me tons of advice, lots of help, and frankly, credibility. You know, those yeah. guys endorsed me, wrote checks, and and then it was a guy named John McIver, who was this great Wisconsin leader of our party, and George Style, and just a bunch of older, you know, established guys in the Wisconsin conservative movement. Uh, ended up just taking a risk on a young guy like me. And I ended up winning my race by 15 points, you know, it was, and I ran basically a Kempian kind of uh, yep. campaign. Yep. Well, let's talk and, about uh, that campaign. Cause I think first campaigns are always interesting yeah. with people who have been through so many political wars that you've been through. My, my, my greatest story is a John McCain story. Uh, he comes back from uh, Vietnam. He's still in the military. He does a bunch of stuff, gets on the Hill has mentors just like you. He gets to know some of these greats of the uh, uh, defense establishment. Right. Goes, goes, marries Cindy McCain, goes to live with her in Arizona, leaves the military. And in his first campaign gets attacked for being a carpetbagger. Now, everybody who's in the state of Arizona is a carpetbagger. Right, right, right. And so he, he, but he handled it in a way that was so classic McCain and it completely turned around his race. And if there was one moment 
it was it was this, which was he was in a debate with his Democratic opponent and they threw the carpetbagger line. And he said, look, he's like, I, 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 I profess I'm new to this state and I'm going to learn to love this state. But I grew up in a Navy family. I never lived any longer than a year or two in any one place in the country because my parents served. And, and the longest single place I've ever lived in my entire life was the Hanoi Hilton for five and a half years in Vietnam. <laughs> he said, so pardon me for not having deep roots in any one state, but I'm here to get the, to help this state any way I can. And that was it, right? I yeah. mean, like, no yeah, more yeah. talk about carpet bagging. Yeah, I got the young thing thrown at me. And, yep. you know, I, I was, I mean, I'm like, I'm 27. In Wisconsin. I mean, yeah, I was young. And so 28, when I, by the time the campaign ended up rolling around. Yep. Uh, and I got the young thing thrown at me. So I call these political jujitsu. So you just run at your perceived weakness and turn it into a strength. And basically, I had a strategy to do that. And I ran against the woman who was the Kenosha City Council president, who was fairly wealthy, who had just barely be, uh, lost to Mark Newman in the prior campaign. Yep. So everybody basically marked me for dead and thought she was going <laughs> to waltz right into the seat because she almost beat the incumbent by within like, you know, six, eight points, six tenths, tenths, tenths of a of point, point, less yeah. than a percentage point. Right. She had a lot of money and a lot of name ID, and she was the president of the biggest town in the district, Kenosha. And, and I was this, this kid from Janesville, the small town in the district, and, uh, you know, I ended up working out pretty well. But uh, but I can't I can't match John McCain's stories. I can't <laughs> post. So we well, never know. I mean, uh, but I think you take your weaknesses and you turn them into strength, and then and that's 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 what I did with my youth. And I just uh, I tried to make it uh, 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 an advantage, and ended up working out that way. That's great. That's great. No, I think that's that that should be inspiring for anybody who's young and thinks, well, you know, I I got to I got to put a bunch of barnacles on my ship before I can. Uh, Right. try politics but but really it's for people who actually want to create a change and you shouldn't think twice about it uh i'm constantly oh, encouraging young people to get involved in politics because otherwise you become jaded to it right and <clears throat> the minute you realize you can actually impact things i took the different route i i thought it was more important to get guys like you elected than to be one of them and uh and so uh i've i've constantly tried to recruit uh young people for seats that uh, otherwise would have gone to somebody who was at the end of their life who thought it was That's a right. retirement plan. Same here. And uh, so I, I think it's great. Um, let's move the dial up a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I know people love to talk about presidential politics, especially in a, a presidential election year. Uh, and, uh, and, and let's talk about your selection as VP. Uh, I, I had a lot to do with VP picks over the years. I was part of the Dole campaign when we picked one of your mentors, Jack Kemp. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, a huge surprise. Nobody was looking in his direction. Uh, uh, it was a shock to the political system. Uh, I learned a lot about that when uh, uh, one of your congressional colleagues, Dan Quayle, was picked to serve as yep. George H.W. Bush's vice president. Shocked the world. Nobody I saw remember that, that coming. Too. Yeah. It wasn't on anybody's list of nine or 10 candidates. And, and that was kind of the approach we took with John McCain when he selected Sarah Palin to be his running mate was um, one defy conventional wisdom because our view was conventional wisdom wasn't going to help him win real win election, and and two um, uh, we had this weird timetable where the the Democratic convention was the week before ours. It was the first time the two had been sandwiched together like this year, and um, and and so we we actually had this kind of novel notion that you let the Democrats have their week. You know, it's their time to make a message to the American public. And, and we wanted to give them that space and not have the noise of our vice presidential pick uh, 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 looking like we were trying to overshadow it. I think those kind of days are gone. <laughs> but um, sure. but it, was, it was quite a scene. I had to dispatch my, my lead advance as a fellow named Davis White from Alabama. No, no assemblage to, to my history in Alabama, but just a great guy. And we had to find a way to secretly get... Sarah Palin from Alaska to Sedona, Arizona, which yeah. is not an easy thing, even if you're That's not right. being secretive. And uh, and so I said, you know, who do you know who's not on the campaign, who could who's got a credit card? Because I mean, people were monitoring everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who could get a flight to Alaska tonight? And this was at uh, like nine o'clock in the morning. And he said his roommate from college was unemployed <laughs> and would be doing it in a minute. So I said, dispatch him. He'd never spent a day in politics whatsoever. Really? gets on a plane and flies to Alaska. And I said, call us when you get there and we'll tell you what you're there for. 
And um, and we had two different private planes that ferreted them down to Sedona, Arizona for a secret meeting. Uh, we picked up Sarah Palin in a van with the windows blacked out with baby on board signs. I mean, it was pretty, oh my gosh. pretty rudimentary. But I know you had a similar experience where yeah. I was talking to Beth Myers before uh, talking to you. She's a great friend of mine and yeah. said that her son, Kurt, kind of played yeah. the role of- I was uh, just getting into that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so give us a little, give us a little hint of that. Cause I mean, the suspense is something you don't usually think of when thinking about politics. You just made me, that's why I looked at my phone. I was just checking my timeline. You, you, you reminded me of that story. Um, so uh, I'm trying to go back to the exact moment. So I was being tracked uh, by trackers, you know. Uh, this well, you were actually not a surprise pick. Right? No, I wasn't. I mean, surprise. there was an was enormous like short amount short. of news about you being the perfect vice presidential choice. Yeah, it's weird. I'm a house guy from Wisconsin. <laughs> right. So usually you don't pick, you know, districts, you pick statewide people. So frankly, I didn't think he'd pick me because uh, I'll, I'll say one story and then I'll go into this. Uh, I was budget chair at the time and I articulate, I passed all these big budgets that just had enormous entitlement. Um, the budget at that time cut $4.6 trillion of spending out of the budget over right. 10 years. And that was a lot in those days. Um, <laughs> and so yeah. I was like, there's no way he's going to pick me. I'm the guy who authored all these budget cuts. I mean, there's just no way. He, and, and later Mitch said, look, I was, I believed in your budget. I believed in what you did. I thought you'd help me govern. And I figured I'm going to have to defend this guy's budget anyway. I might as well put him on the ticket to have the best guy right. defending. You are going to be <laughs> so, the Democrats' version yeah, of the vice so president. I was going to be there. So, but I, that was, there's several Methodists, but I'm like, there's no way he'll pick me. I'm the guy who authored all these gory policy details that will get wrapped around his neck. And, you know, I just could have assumed that, but I digress. So, um, so I was getting tracked in those days. It was like Portman. Palenti, um, you well, know, it was everybody other, we didn't pick. <laughs> yeah, right. It was all the people you didn't pick. They were all and, the same uh, guys on our list. Yeah. And so this, this Alex Mo, she's a delightful, she's a good friend of mine. She's a delightful NBC um, reporter. Right. And we're like driving around. I was campaigning for Peter Roskam then, uh, just a, a house member in Chicago, just a couple hours south of where I live. And and there's just somebody following us. I'm like, what the heck is that? And it ended up being this embassy news reporter and then a few others. And they're like packed, parked out in front of my house. And it was a little unnerving, frankly. And we ended up getting to know her. I felt better because she wasn't like a creepy person. She was actually a delightful human being. But I had this string of trackers tracking me wherever I went. And so I had to figure out how to shake the trackers, uh, but then think that I was still home so that, so we could throw them off the scent. And um, the first time was I had to meet with Mitt in person just to have a meeting. And <laughs> so I met, uh, so I, they had to figure out a time for me to look like I was still at home um, and, and not, um, you know, running around the country. So I was filming TV commercials for my reelect and they're tracking me. And I got home at late at night after filming and then went out the back door and went through the woods. I live on a little uh, green belt of like three acres of woods behind our house. Uh, which is actually behind the house I grew up in and snuck through the woods, got in my chief of staff's truck, his pickup truck, and he took me to O'Hare. He went and checked in, uh, checked me into um, uh, the hotel across the street from the airport. There's little Hilton. And I gave me the keys. I went up the back door, got in my room. And then the next morning at like 5 a.m., I had a flight where I had sunglasses, baseball hat to Connecticut. No fake nose. <laughs> no fake nose, but something close to it, to Connecticut. Uh, and then, Kurt, uh, Beth Meyer's son, who was just like a college kid in those days. Yeah, a baseball 19 player years in college. old, maybe not even yeah. in college. Yeah, I don't, yeah I mean, he may not even been in college. He was 19, he picks me up in, in Connecticut uh, at an airport. I get off, get in the car, and we're driving to Beth Meyer's house, and she's getting staked out as well. Right. So he has me lay down in the back seat with a blanket over me. He pulls in the garage, and they're used to seeing Kurt come and go. Right. Pulls in the garage, and then, you know, an hour later, Mitt comes over in his, you know, campaign motorcade at the time, uh, and then we have a long uh, lunch and all of this stuff. And he uh, asked me to join the ticket. Uh, and, and frankly, I, you know, uh, I, before I just didn't think he'd pick me. I just didn't think you, you don't pick the guy with all the gory budget cuts and his rationale. I was very impressed with, which was right. I'm not picking you to help me, you know, with, with a cohort, with a state, with, I just pick you because I think you'll help me govern. I want a right. guy who's going to help me govern who knows all this stuff. And, and you know, the things I don't know. And, so I was very taken by that, agreed to it. 
then get back in the car and under the um, blanket and back to Connecticut and back to the airport. And it was basically, we did it on a Sunday. So um, the people staking my house just never thought I left home, you know, and, and that I was watching Packer games all day or something like that, which is <laughs> what I would have been doing. <laughs> and so I snuck back in my house, go on for uh, uh, three or four weeks. And there right. was a, there was a horrible shooting in my district at this Sikh temple, Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. And so we delayed um, the announcement because of that. And we were going to announce like somewhere in New Hampshire, I think. And the next time I could do it, which was the next day, coincidentally, Mitt was doing an event at the, on the um, USS Wisconsin in Norfolk, Virginia, or Perfect. Norfolk, as they say it there. Um, yeah. You learn all these pronunciations. Yeah, you've campaigned in a lot of districts. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so uh, it was great. And it was a ship, the USS Wisconsin. My mom, my, my grandfather was a, uh, was a commander of the Navy in World War II. Yep. So my mom remembers being on that ship in California for like family day. It's just a, an amazing, neat little story. So do the cloak and dagger thing. I've got all these stringers following me around. They followed me to this funeral. They followed me home. And my whole family had to go with me. So how do we like extricate my family during the day with all these trackers out front? So Jana and the kids, while I was at this funeral, went to my chief of staff's house separately and the trackers weren't paying attention to that. And my chief of staff had this old, like, you know, custom Starcraft van with tinted windows on it, you know, for family, <laughs> you know, Clark Griswold kind of a thing. And my kids didn't know anything about this. We didn't tell our kids anything because we, they were young. We worried they'd talk. So my wife was in on it, obviously, my chief of staff's wife, and uh, they had my kids in the van, and they park a block away at the end of this, these woods. I come back with my chief of staff uh, and the, the, the stringers following me, going to my house. We had gotten my sister-in-law, who looks just like my wife, to fly in, get inside the house. She looks like my wife, uh, to be there. So I'm there. Jan and the kids are in the van down the street at the end of these woods. I uh, put camo on. I'm a big bow hunter, so I have a lot of camo. And I, I sneak out through my backyard because they can see sort of into the backyard, sneak out through these trees, uh, <laughs> into the woods, and and through the woods, into the van. And then we go to Waukegan, Illinois, because it's like a Chicago suburb right. where they have a plane to take me to um, North Carolina and then drive into Virginia. And, and it was it was Ed Gillespie. Uh, was He's a good buddy of mine. He was sort of a part of this uh and beth myers and who met me in north carolina where i was writing my speech and acceptance and working out of the whole time and the uh the stringers are outside the, the trackers are outside and my sister-in-law like i said who looks like my wife wears one of my wife's clothes sundress or something like that has my dogs coming and going the neighborhood kids came over to play with my kids she has them come in she bakes them a pie has them watch some cartoons so they're there for a while turns lights on, lets dogs out. So they see this woman walking around inside the house, kids coming in the house, the neighborhood kids. So they are convinced we're in the home and that Jana, my wife, is. they saw her a few times, which was actually Dana, my sister-in-law. Meanwhile, we're in North Carolina, um, uh, near the Virginia border, uh, getting ready for the announcement. And so we were able to shake the trackers, fly to North Carolina on some private, you know, plane from Illinois to North Carolina to drive near Virginia to do the announcement. And we end up pulling it off. And I, I still feel bad about Alex Mo to this day. Cause like I said, she's <laughs> a really cool person. She was out in front of my house at like midnight on MSNBC. They're saying, we well, here is Paul Ryan. We hear it's Paul. They're like, no, no, he's inside right now in the house. I'm here on his front lawn and he's in there right now. And, and I just saw his wife. So it's not Paul Ryan because he's here in Janesville, Wisconsin. He alone bought the campaign yeah. 12 hours. Of yeah, people. she did. And I'm like, oh, I felt so bad for her because she got totally duped. I ended up calling Chuck Dodd the next day saying, go easy on her. You know what I mean? Don't, right, right. Don't throw her under the bus. It's not her fault. Yeah. You know, we just were good at deceiving her. Somebody so had to take the hit. Right? Somebody had to take the hit. And she, she was just doubling down on, it is not Paul Ryan. He is here. <laughs> so that's, that's how that went down. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Governor Plenty. I feel so bad for him because he was everybody's favorite pick and never made it to the finish line. Yeah. And, uh, but he was a great guy. I mean, I couldn't have done it without him with Sarah Palin because I, I, there was so much excitement about him in that 2008 race. And and we literally, uh, he was our shill. So he was all staked out. And, um, and so we made a big deal about the fact that, you know, uh, uh, 
Senator McCain was talking to him, you know, the, the morning before the Democratic convention. He, we had him walk out and get his mail and talk to the press and sort of pimp it a little bit. Yep. And, uh, and he really took the hit. He was such a good sport about it. And, uh, and it bought us a week uh, that we otherwise uh, right. wouldn't have had, frankly. Somebody would have figured out because they're chasing tail numbers on airplanes. Oh, yeah. They you were know, doing all that stuff. Who's yeah. flying right. in? And, mm-hmm. uh, and so the, the sleuth nature of it is quite something. But you mentioned you know, the, uh, the important role that your family played in all that. I don't think people sometimes really realize that it's not just Paul Ryan showing up for an event right. on the USS Wisconsin and, and getting the nod for vice president. I mean, there's a entire family that's impacted by oh. that. Um, when, when we snuck Sarah Palin down to Sedona, uh, the deal got done with John and then we flew her to this little uh, airport in Dayton because two days later, uh, Sarah McCain was gonna be in Dayton and we picked that place to uh, announce her. And she was staying in this really miserable, lousy airport hotel next to the, the Dayton airport. And, and we had to get her family there. And they, as, just like you, they knew nothing about this. And right. so we sent an advanced staff, they picked them up, they put them on a plane, they flew them to Dayton. And until they got to the hotel to see their mom, they didn't know that she, they were there because of an announcement the next day. I must admit my biggest problem was the Secret Service because uh, they wanted to pick up whoever was going to be the nominee. And we pushed it all the way until yeah. the week before the uh, convention. And uh, and all Senator McCain gave me his guidance is like, keep them out of it. They leak like a sieve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had the same issue. Uh, same thing. So, so Beth negotiated that they'd have one guy, one guy with a Suburban, which come to North Carolina to get us and drive us to Virginia. One guy and that, that was she the, knew that was the morning him. of your announcement. Yeah, right? the morning of yeah. it. Because she's like, there's no way you cannot send all these people. It's just not gonna right. you know I mean they, they, same they, thing. they draw a lot of attention with all these yeah right right you know black just limos. One, <laughs> yeah it's one guy in a suburban who just showed right. up and uh you yeah know, the deal I had to cut was we, we we met him on a park on the way to the rally that was unveiling Sarah Palin <laughs> in Dayton, Ohio. And I said, look you you can escort her into the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, and we figured by then it would be blown anyway. But uh, but it, my kids, it was a, a great deal. story. My kids, we told them on the plane on the way from Waukegan to North Carolina, because my kids are like, what is going on here? What why, is why is all said, the secrecy? Right. Yeah, they were like and they're pretty young, but still. And my daughter was figuring it out. She was starting to figure it out. She's she was the oldest. I said, we're going to go get on a plane and fly somewhere. And I, I'm going to explain all of this on the plane. So just bear with me. And and they were, you know, my daughter was really excited. My middle son, who's very contemplative, was just really quiet. And my youngest son is, wait a second. <laughs> wait, if you, if, if this thing, ha- are we, does that mean we have to move? I'm like, yeah, we have to move. They're like, I don't want to move. What are you, my friends? And he was listing right. off all the names. Look how this is going to affect me. Me, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh my, my God. I, and I told him, well, it's a cool house. And I said, it's got a neat swimming pool. At the house, you know the the, the, the observatory. And he's like, Enticements for the kids. There's a pool, and I said, "Yeah, there's there's a pool there." He's like, "Oh, well, maybe I I could do this." <laughs> so I got him right. on the swimming pool at the vice president's residence to just not have a meltdown. Um, my wife, before so when you get vetted, I mean, I don't know how your system works, but Beth Myers is a very detail oriented person, and so they have law firm accountants and like private investigator types scrub you for like three months to just go through everything in your background, which, you know, I always tell people that the cleanest people in politics are the people who run uh, as writing base. Right, because right. They just They're already they're vetted. So, right. so scrubbed. And, and I know Sarah was a little more of a short-term thing in your, in your case, but um, so it was, I want to say, uh, Mitt and I helped Mitt win the primary in Wisconsin. And uh, so it was like March. And after the primary, he called me and asked me if I'd be willing to be considered. And I figured they're just rounding out their list. And right. I was just sort of, you know, chum for the conservative Tea Party base. Back then, I was a conservative hero in the fiscal conservatives. Um, then you become speaker and you're part of the establishment. Right. <laughs> but, right. but I digress. Well, so remember so, the Maverick uh, John McCain became yeah, the nominee, yeah, yeah, and all right. of a sudden he's the establishment George Bush. Exactly. Guy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I got the same stuff, same thing. And um, uh, so when, when we got asked to be vetted, uh, I said to Jana, I said, look, you got to understand, um, we, this is the time to decide now. So we have to decide if asked, we will serve and do this. 
otherwise let's not let them vet us and, and be, even be considered. So we did the whole pros and cons and this and that. And we decided, okay, go ahead. We'll, we'll do, we'll be considered. And so three months forward. Uh, and then I, I do the Kurt picks me up. I go to the best house and mid asked me and I called Jan on the way. And, and she said, well, what happened? I said, well, yeah, he asked me to join the ticket. And he said, well, what did you say? I said, well, I said, yeah, I said, yes. It's like, well, You've what asked, you, discuss? you must like, serve. We, we, yeah, we discussed this three months ago. Remember when right. I said, if we, if we go through this and get asked, we will do it. She said, yeah, but I didn't think you'd get picked. <laughs> so, There's a confidence so, level. She's like, what? You know, I didn't, I really didn't think he'd pick you. So it was, it was, so, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're stuffed in a cannon and shot out to the country instantly. 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 And thank God I had 12 years of Congress under my belt. And, you know, I'd had a, I mean, I defended all these budgets. And so I had a bunch of live rounds fired into me and TV and Sunday shows. So for me, I felt like I was pretty battle tested and pretty thick skinned, but the family doesn't have that experience. They don't have that, so but they, they are just thrust out there with into you it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, so fr frankly, it's a bigger stretch and a, and a bigger leap for them than it is for you because, you know, you're a public person. So exactly. Yeah. You you expect it and people expect to see you. But <clears throat> part of the really interesting thing, I think, about presidential campaigns, having worked on, you know, from Reagan and 80 all the way through, is I think they're the most personal campaigns a candidate can run for. Um, the public gets to know you incredibly well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would dare say that, uh, and with no offense, I mean, at congressional campaigns, I mean, a lot of them are, you're, you're knocking on doors and you're yeah. getting face-to-face. -face Very personal. Yeah. Personal campaigns. But the depth of knowledge that they have of you, I mean, the, the your families, your history growing up, none of that really penetrates in a congressional campaign. But boy, if you're on the national ticket. For sure. Public, not only wants to get to know you, but they kind of feel it's your obligation to tell them all about you. Absolutely. And, uh, and that includes your entire family. Nobody gets to escape the uh, Klieg lights. Everybody, they, they, they invaded Janesville, Wisconsin, which was just, you know, weird for Janesville, Wisconsin. People loved the attention that our, our town got. So frankly, it was something that put Janesville on the map and they were very excited, but they, you know, they went to the guy who my hair. They went to the, the little Italian restaurant we did take out from once a week. They went to high school government teachers who are all big Democrats, but good friends <laughs> mine nonetheless. You know what I mean? Uh -oh. <laughs> so they just, no, it was all good. But they went to, and obviously my family, my extended family, my brothers, my sister, my mom, and all of that stuff. So uh, all of that, the whole family and community get involved in one of these deals. So I actually look back at it with um, great fondness, with a great memory. I mean, I'm you know, still to this day, it's the only campaign I ever lost. It's still to this day, you know, it, it burns to have lost that. And you know, exactly the same feeling. Oh, yes. It's, yes. Uh, uh, you, you never get over it. Um, and, you never uh, do. You never do. Because you, you you see what's happening and you realize we could have done something different or we yeah. could have had an impact. And, and you realize that elections have consequences. Right. And it's not just an event. It actually has a bearing on the direction of the country. And frankly, more and more the direction of the world. Right. And so I, I believe me, I feel your pain and, and understand there's never been a presidential election where we've lost, where you don't think about that every day of your life. Um, you do. Let's, let's talk Congress. a little bit about that campaign. Um, we have debates coming up. Uh, it's uh, September 29th. I don't know when this is going to air, but um, it's, it's pretty close to the current events today. Um, uh, you had also a common uh, experience with Sarah Palin. <laughs> In addition to the methodology with which you were announced, you actually had to debate, both of you had to debate Joe yeah. Biden, right. who's going to be in a debate uh, probably of his life uh, come the 29th. And, uh, and give me some of your, your sense of that, because um, we had a rocky road um, uh, with debate prep with Sarah Palin. Uh, you know, we, we, had her huddled up in a hotel suite in a conference center in Philadelphia, just happened to be the last place she was at when, when we took her off the road, uh, whole team sort of battering her on issues. She, she knew a lot about state issues in Alaska, but not a lot about foreign policy, national security, you know, uh, economics. And so it was a real, uh, grind. And I got a call from the guy who was playing Joe Biden 
in her debate prep, Randy Schooneman, uh, who was our foreign policy advisor. And we figured since oh, yeah. Joe was so big yeah, on foreign him. policy, yeah. we'd, we'd use him. And he said, look, this isn't working. Uh, she's never done something like this. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad scene. So I, I went up there with uh, a couple of my campaign team and, and it smelly, you know, uh, food still left open in the debate room, um, you know, notes all over table. And I took a gamble and called Cindy McCain and said, look, um, I'm going to put Sarah Palin on her plane and fly her out this afternoon to Sedona. Uh, she needs to get outside. She was a, she was a, person who loved the outdoors, ran every yeah. day, um, uh, much like you. I mean, finding time on a campaign to stay fit and and yeah. clear your mind with exercise, yeah. very hard to do. Uh, but she found it in Sedona. Uh, it was the perfect elixir to prep her in a much more soft way than the sort of schoolroom stuff that we were doing in Philadelphia. And, and she did a great job on Joe. It was her personality you know, and uh, she did. She actually that was a she did very well. In that she debate. did a great job. And and I don't think she must think Joe Biden was expecting waking at people once. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, yeah. Yeah. But he seemed he seemed a lot different when he debated you. You got the feisty Joe Biden. So mm -hmm. let's talk about your debate prep a little bit and maybe yeah. some story off of that. And then I'd love to get your view of like when you're sitting there on camera in the most important you know debate of your life. And the guy's making faces at you. I yeah, it was yeah, the yeah. Strangest thing. Yeah, so there, I'll definitely get into that. Um, so my, I'm a big outdoors guy too, and so they kind of knew that. So I did my prep at two places in rural Oregon because I was out there raising money in the Pacific Northwest. You don't get you don't campaign in the Pacific Northwest, but you no, you do raise there. money though. <laughs> you do raise. So I was in Oregon at this place called the Rosada Ranch. Just this kind of rural resort um, at the foothill of these mountains for or I don't know, three, four days. Uh, Ted Olson, who's a buddy of mine, um, yeah. was was Joe Biden. Ted Olson was the Solicitor General. Solicitor Bush. General, right. Yeah, just yeah. A, 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 a legal genius. And he's yeah. a friend of mine. And he, we had him play Biden. And he really did a great job on it. And uh, and then I'll digress for a second. He mentioned the outdoor stuff. So I'm a big mountain biker and, and like to do that kind of stuff. So I would go on early morning mountain bikes and I kept losing the secret service guys because, you know, <laughs> they didn't do what I did. <laughs> no, I didn't try to. I just, you know, I felt bad and I'd wait for like a half hour for these guys to catch up. And um, they finally flew Bush's guys in because Bush is a, George Bush is a big mountain biker. So they flew these mountain biking, you know, secret service guys who then would, whenever I'd do this, they'd go with me and it, it worked out fine. I digress. A special division. <laughs> yeah, they had these like mountain biking agents. So because the other ones just aren't used to doing that. And it's, uh, and it's an acquired, you know, skill yes. set. And Different so, set of muscles than when you're a runner. Yeah, yeah all that stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. So, uh, so I uh, uh, did that. And then we went to Wintergreen. I think that's the name of this resort in Virginia or West Virginia. It's this that's like right. ski hill just place. In, yeah. uh, Blue Ridge uh, next to the Yeah, South. in the Blue Ridge right. Mountains. And we, we basically took the indoor tennis court over, you know, one of those sort of bubble tennis courts and built a stage that looks – precisely like the stage that we were going to do our debate and so carrie healy was martha raddatz martha raddatz was the uh, moderator the moderator Ted olson right. uh carrie healy was the lieutenant governor of, of massachusetts and then that the, uh went on to uh, be a college president just a really dear friend um and then ted olson and we did mock debates for th three or four days uh and so my problem was never domestic policy or federal policy it was really foreign policy because I was such a domestic guy. I was a ways and means yeah. budget guy. So I just sort of marinated in all the foreign policy issues quite a bit. L all the briefings I got were all foreign policy. Cause I really didn't have to phone up on domestic issues because you know I right. lived, you were ready I lived to go. that stuff. I was ready to go. And my problem, as we perceived it, was I was 42 years old. I looked really young. And so we were worried about sort of the Dan Quayle thing. And if you remember yeah. Lloyd Benson schooling Dan Quayle in that debate, you're no Jack Kennedy, that line. We're like, we've got to avoid, you know, uh, this because everybody's going to it's going to be a testament of Mitt Romney's judgment. Did he judge a guy who's just too young and who right. I can't envision being in the, the job, becoming president? So for me, I wasn't worried about passing sort of the policy acumen test. I was worried about passing um, the is this guy too young or is he ready? The temperament test. So it was all about uh, temperament. Backstop one more point. Uh, Mitt 
basically kicked Obama's butt in the De Denver debate. That first debate was that. a disaster, that right? Debate. All the press about was, Obama wasn't ready, what's yeah, wrong with disaster. his debate prep. Yeah. Right. So Mitt just cleaned his clock. It was a great debate. And Mitt, Mitt's got a real fast mind. Everyone, everybody knows that. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so they were on their heels, they, the, the Obama campaign. And then, and we, we predicted Joe was going to do everything he can to get me to lose my temperament, to show that I was hot tempered, young, spoke too fast, and blah, 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 nervous and all this stuff. So I had to just go easy and cool. And Ted Olson in all our practices went off the handle, wild gestures, making faces, doing weird stuff, all to try and bait me to to just lose my temperament and look like, like I was too young. And we predicted that was going to be their strategy. And lo and behold, that's exactly what, that's they, exactly did. what they did. Right. That's exactly what Joe did. Joe, when I was speaking, he'd be muttering things under his mouth to try and bait me like you, blah, 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 blah. just mm -hmm. muttering stuff to me to try and throw me off. Um, one of the weird things is, like I said, I, I'm a high metabolism guy. I work out a lot, drink a ton of water. And, and the staff said, hey, you made that famous. <laughs> I made that famous. The staff said, look, you, you go to the bathroom a lot. They're like, we don't know how else to say this, but we, you exercise a lot, you drink a ton of water and you go to the bathroom all the time. And this debate's gonna be, what it was like two, three hours. He's like, you're not gonna be able to go to the bathroom. So you just stop drinking water uh, that day. You know, stop. You know. So I go for this long- <laughs> Be a little dehydrated, day. it's okay. Yeah, I was totally dehydrated. Cause I, I did this long workout that day just to clear my mind and get you know things going. And I didn't drink any water. And I finally get there and I'm so damn thirsty that I just kept drinking water. Because I was really, really thirsty um, while Joe was talking and they made fun of me for drinking so much water. That was like one of the Saturday Night Live skits. But, but so I digress on that point. But Joe, he did exactly what we thought he would do. He was yep. going weird and wild and crazy, um, trying to get me. And I kept thinking to myself, I like where I am. I like my offense. I'm going to say things that are going to get you to go weird. I'm going to try and get him to get mad and get him to lose his temper. And I'm going to be cool hand Luke here. I'm going to just be cool as a cucumber, temperamentally sound. I'm not going to get a kill shot on Joe Biden. I mean, back then Joe Biden was really on his game. So I was never going to think that I was going to totally vanquish him in a debate. It was not my goal was to vanquish him in a debate. He was well known already. He was the vice president. I was the unknown 42 year old. So I just had to display uh, competence and even keelness and, and an even temperament so that people could say, yeah, I, I could see that guy in the Oval Office. And as his strategy, as time went on, was failing, he got angrier and more volatile and more emotionally just sort of wild because it was, it was clear to me in the moment was he is not getting me to lose my cool, getting me to lose my temperament, speak too fast, to look young. So he kept amping it up. And I and I thought the trajectory was perfect in the middle of the debate. I'm like, I like where I am. Hey, you're not going to- You could feel gonna, comfortable. You felt I like you were pacing it. I'm yep. pacing it well. Um, and like I said, I wasn't out to just vanquish him because it's. I just didn't think I was going to- I actually right. know Joe pretty well. I, I always liked him. I you know got along with him pretty well. well. As you said, your job was to be credible to the American yeah. public. Yeah, so as I wasn't going to get a kill right. shot on the guy. You're, you're just not going to get that. And so right. I was like, just be- you know, steady, cool, calm, competent, and and then and then he'll get crazier as time goes on, trying to get me to lose my cool. And I like where I am, and I, I like where he's going, which is in this weird place. Yeah. So he ended up helping his base, which was the other thing he was trying to do, right. get his base stirred up and riled up and and going, because Obama laid an egg against Mitt earlier. And so that to it did me change was, the narrative, right? I mean, people were right. much happier with the campaign after that debate, not because of anything Obama did, but because Joe really went to town on you. Yeah. But I think all the pundits were like, wow, this was the craziest debate performance we've ever seen. I know. Yeah, and so he had two goals. Get the base riled up and happy because uh, they were deflated. Try to get me to lose my cool. I'm like, I don't, there's nothing I can do about him getting his debate, his debate base riled up and happy. That, he's going to do that. That has nothing to do with me. Don't lose my cool. Keep my temperament. Um, and, and I remember it was, Dan Quayle, I think I called as soon as I got picked. You know, I didn't really know him very well. I knew his son and his son served with me in Congress. Yep. I called him like, any advice he got for me? You know, you were a young dude who got picked that no one really, you know, cause, and, and he said, yeah, you got three things you got to do. Have a good announcement. I just watched it. I called him like that night when I was on. He said, you did fine. That was great. He said, you got to have a good convention speech. 
and then you got to have a good debate and that's all you got to do. And then just right. go enjoy the campaign. You got right. those raise a lot of money, <laughs> do those well. And the rest of it, you know, just do, just enjoy yep. it. Yeah. Raise money, do rallies, blah, 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 blah. So after my debate, it was actually really re relaxing. My family loved flying around the country. My kids just thought, I mean, they saw so much of America. It was really neat. Well, it's a, it's a, and it's a working history lesson, right? It is. It's a working history lesson. And I spent a lot of my time with Mike Levitt on conference calls, working on the planning of government. So Mike was our transition he guy. He was your transition director, yep. Right, so I spent a ton of time. Mitch just said, can you just go work on this? I'm gonna work on my debates. And so he had two more debates to go. So I spent a lot of time with Chris Lydell, who's in the White House now, and, and, and Mike Levitt, you know, who's gonna be OMB? Who's gonna, what are the guys you wanna look at treasury? What are, are the, what are the top 10 things? What are the executive orders? How, how do we run a, round out the cabinet? So I spent a lot of my time on transition planning uh, and then rallies and, uh, and it just, my family enjoyed that, but that's to your earlier point. I remember losing obviously, and then going to Obama's, I was still in Congress going to Obama's um, second inaugural. Right. And just sitting there, I was sitting next to Beyonce and, uh, which was you know, <laughs> kind of a cool thing. And yeah. her husband, he's, he, yeah, he was actually a pretty neat guy. Um, and I'm like, Oh my God. I now I know exactly what we were planning on doing, what the what the term of the Romney Ryan administration was going to be. I know the budget we were going to do, I know the tax plan we we're going to do, the military, because I had planned this whole plan thing out with Mitt and, and Mike Levitt. Yep. And then I'm sitting here watching Obama going the exact opposite direction with the country. It was I was basically depressed for a year, frankly. Uh, yeah. Just watching because I knew granular in a granular detail, just all those things that we had. And planning on doing that. Yeah, I won't ask you how about. ugly those budget cuts would have been in the first year of the uh, <laughs> the administration. Uh, it's all about compounding numbers going the right way. You know. <laughs> exactly. About entitlement reform. But yeah. It may have been our last chance to really get ahead of the deficit pro yeah. problem. I mean, you yeah, know, I think it, that's right. It, it's it, I don't I don't know when I, our children will be tasked with the job of fixing that problem. Uh, we can't wait that long because we'll lose our reserve currency before that if, if, if we don't watch it, I think. Uh, that's a whole other policy question. I think I, I personally, I never like commissions much, frankly. Uh, I think it's Congress copping out. But, I oh, but think you're, that's the only you're way to well go. out there on the Simpson-Bowles Commission, though, yeah, right? Yeah, I was on that. But that one was ignored because uh, it was an executive order commission. The afternoon we came out with it, Obama and Pelosi said, yeah, we're not doing it. And then yeah. we were done. <laughs> so I think a commission with teeth. Like the old Greenspan Social Security Commission, yep. or like BRAC commit back, you know, base closings. That's the only way to do it, and I personally think that's where we have to go now. Yeah, it's uh, almost like, like yeah, BRAC. You have to actually vote against their recommendations to to change it, right? I mean, yeah, right. So have the commission and, empowered to actually implement something, and you cannot filibuster it, and you have to have the vote. So the Congress and the President don't have to be there for the takeoff and the assembly. They have to just be there for the landing, and they can't duck the vote. Well, so, so I, I honestly a, think that's a minute. the only way to um, go. Sequestration. Would you do that again? I mean, that was sort of one of those issues that people said, hey, this is great. We're going to take away from ourselves the ability to bust budgets. And uh, I like I like forcing mechanisms. Uh, it was a forcing. Patty I mean, Murray. Graham Rudman was a very successful forcing yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Right. I think everybody looks back on that and said, wow, that worked great. Yeah. So that was deficit targets. Uh, uh, Sequestration was just is, is discretionary. There's a little bit of sequester on mandatory, but really it's it's mostly a discretionary thing. It's basically an anti-military thing. So yeah. uh yeah, Patty Murray and I did the first budget deal to to replace sequestration for for a for a for a budget cycle for two years. And she and I did that Murray Ryan deal uh where we we cut eighty-five billion dollars for fifty. So I think that was a number. So we basically it was we did mandatory savings and we had deficit reduction. Yeah. So the deal Patty and I did to, was forced to buy sequester because we didn't want the military cuts. So Obama didn't like the domestic cuts. That actually forced us into a good deal. But then it got uglier and we got worse deals as time went on. Um, Boehner and Obama did the next one. Uh, and uh, and then I did one with um, uh, with when I was speaker uh, so to the uh, two year deal. And we just basically did one for one on, on deficit. So. Yeah. No, sequestration in and of itself is a bad thing. It's a crude thing. It's, and, and discretionary spending is not the problem. It's mandatory. It's mandatory. But but it did force us to do a few successive budget deals. Um, the first one was a pretty good one because it, right. it achieved net deficit reduction. Yep. Um, 
Maybe uh, finishing up with one last question. Um, your district, uh, when you were in Congress, included Kenosha. We yeah. know that uh, there's a lot of civil unrest that has swept the country for many different reasons. And, and the shooting in Kenosha is just the most recent. Uh, it's certainly not a, uh, uh, an event on its own that would do this, but uh, certainly a, a symptom of a problem that has been sweeping the country for some time with a, with, with a vexing uh, outcome with politicians. I mean, what do you do? And uh, right. kind of getting away from how it's been treated in this year's election cycle um, uh, you know that community, you know the people in it. Um, how, do you, how do you get beyond the, the, the protest movement and the backlash from police and law enforcement? Um, how do you move the country forward? What's, what's the elixir from, from what you can tell? Because uh, you're never going to avoid events like this happening, but how you manage them seems to be lost in the equation. Yeah, so... In, in Kenosha's case, um, they bust a bunch of people in from out of the area. A lot of people bust in from Chicago. Yeah. Um, they, they arrested these guys from Seattle um, who are like these, these Antifa guys, and they caught them filling um, Molotov cocktails at a gas station with a gas pump uh, and arrested them because uh, they were going to come in and torch the place right. more. Uh, so and these are real anarchists. Anarchist. They're not real anarchist. protesters. Right? Yeah. yeah. And they were, and, and so some got busted in literally. And then some drove in from across the country. And, and so I'm friends with all the, I'm friends with the police chief. I'm friends with the sheriff, the mayor, the county executive right. who are Democrats. Oh, I would call them old school kind of Democrats, you know, sort of union Catholic Democrats um, and uh, the community. So, I mean, I have friends whose businesses got torched. I have a dear friend who had a, who lived next to the police station in a cool townhouse that moved out because of safety for their children. So I've, a lot of dear friends. The restaurant I used to go to. You live to. next to a police station and you're worried about safety. Yeah. It used yeah, to be the other exactly. way around. Exactly. And, you know, and, and this restaurant I used to go to probably once a month, just gone. Uh, really, really tragic. And the shooting was awful. I watched the video many times. So all, all sides of this, just terrible. Um, I guess my quick answer is, I'll, I'll make a political observation, then an answer to your question. The political observation was, in Wisconsin, this is one of the reasons why I think we see tightening in the polls and the Marquette poll, which we think Marquette polls are actually pretty good polls. Pretty they're good poll. Pretty good methodology, and they're usually kind of on. Um, the race is within the margin now uh, for the first time, I think, since ever or months. Uh, and it's basically because of Kenosha, in my opinion. And I think the crosstabs show something like that. And that is when people in Wisconsin see Portland on fire and Seattle on fire and New York City, they're like, hmm. Big city, coasts, Kenosha, down the road, kind of less than 100,000 people. Whoa, this is this is too close to home. And it really right. has freaked people out, uh, understandably yeah. so. And so the whole law and order, you know, thing is um has become front of mind. And that's resonated. And that has abounded to, to Trump's benefit, obviously. Um, th that's the point. Uh, the what do you do about it? Um, I've been talking with my successor, obviously, a lot. He was a guy who was on my staff who's just doing a great job I named Brian Style. I've got a lot of friends in the black community in Kenosha, a lot of pastor buddies of mine. And so I spent, uh, I learned from Jack Kemp this and Bob Woodson. Right. So I spent a great deal of time with the black community in, in that part of the district, uh, which is the populated part of this district. And so, you know, what Brian is now doing and, and is reaching out to all the black pastors and the community leaders who are just wonderful people um, and just just reaching out and talking and just relationship building. And the key is you go and spend a lot of time with people when, when it's not, when you're not looking for their vote, when you're not in campaign mode, when you're in doing mode, when you're in policy making mode, when you're in listening mode, when you're in making a difference mode. And so to me, the community building those, those roots and those ties um, is really important to have dialogues. The problem is all these outside agitators that come in and basically torch the place. That is the problem. And so if it were just up to the local community, we would have had uh, a nice, loud, peaceful protest. Um, you know, we had the kid who shot these guys came in from Antioch, Illinois. So right. the, none of these people are from Kenosha that did no. all this violence. So I think if the communities are left to themselves, they can heal themselves and they can, they can, they can fix these problems. Um, it's it's a tragedy. So uh, what I really hate, and this is a longer conversation, is this the hyperpolar 
polarization that comes from this. And that that seems to make people think you're on this side or that side. It's one right. side or the other. There's there's systemic racism. Or there's no racism. I mean, y- come on. I mean, there's something here in the middle. Right. Serious problems that need to be dealt with. Um, but that doesn't mean radical positions like defunding police departments and things like this. So the problem is our politics are wired to radicalize, to polarize. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, the, the concern I have, and I'll close on this third point, the concern I have with politics today, and John McCain would totally appreciate this, and I knew John well, um, is, is in the old days, like 10 years ago, politics was a meritocracy. If you wanted to be successful, you had to work your way up. John McCain's a perfect example of this. Exactly. You had to work your way up, and, and, the, and the, the measurements of success were persuasion and, and policy. Could you come up with innovative ideas and could you persuade your, your, your colleagues, your constituents, the country, this was the way to go? And, 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 then, and then could you solve problems? Could you put, get things done? That's what I thought you were supposed to do to succeed in politics. Prove yourself through a meritocracy. You know, it took me 20 years you know, to build through it. And that's what I thought was how the coin of the realm that's not the way it is today. I mean, there's still that, but the meritocracy has been replaced with an entertainment wing of our party. Yep. And the entertainment wing is a new incentive structure, which measures success by provocation and entertainment. And can you provoke? Can you entertain? And, and, and the, the method of this is not rolling up your sleeves and working late hours and negotiating with people to get good policies done. No, 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 no. What's your Facebook following? What's your Twitter following? Are you really good on cable and, and talk radio? Can you provoke? Can you entertain? You can leapfrog that entire meritocracy immediately. You can be a contender for national office, run for president without, you know, basically having a cup of coffee in the in Congress. I mean, Obama, I mean, I don't know, he was there, what, two years? I mean, so both sides have this, and you can just leapfrog the meritocracy, never have to prove yourself worthy that you can actually govern. And you can be an instant player. And so entertainment, um, the entertainment wings of both parties um, is a cheaper, faster way to fame and electoral success. But you, you're you worried about your brand. And the brand is not compromising with the other party. The brand is not seeking consensus. The brand is, I am more pure and better than these other jokes jokers in the party. And so you sort of profit at the expense of others within your movement and party. And it, and it requires polarization. And so unfortunately, that is sort of the new political coin of the realm that I'm very, very worried about. My hope in all of this is that we get polarization fatigue in this country and that, that the incentive structure flips back, hopefully. And there's things that I think people need to do to do this so that you actually get back to a meritocracy, a prove you're worthy of leading the country and leading in Congress and in Congress and, and in governor's mansions because of your ability to actually get things done. Um, we're not there now. we got a long ways to go, but my dear, sincere hope is that we can get there. Speaker Ryan, thank you so much for ending this podcast on a optimistic tone. Uh, I think everybody who's in politics really is an optimist. Otherwise, you would have never gotten into this Absolutely. place to begin with. And so thank you very much. Thank you for the time today. I think we have, uh, we've explored a lot of different topics. It's been super educational for us. And and I hope you've enjoyed yourself because uh, uh, you've had a just stellar career and it's it's helpful, I think, especially to young people considering politics to listen to these kinds of podcasts so they can get a sense as to what the expectation is. Every powerful elected official starts somewhere and we appreciate the focus on your career today. So thank My you pleasure. very much for the McCain Institute and uh, good luck in all your future endeavors. All right, Rick, go Packers. Go Packers, there you go. Take care. Thank you. This podcast is produced by Patrick McCann and Justin Kessler. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, tell your friends, or leave a review.